from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and Akashvani. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news, features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell and I'm in London. Hello, it's Jim Maxwell for the ABC in Sydney. Hi, and I'm Sreel Gupta for Akashwani in New Delhi. And on this week's Stumped, we're going to be celebrating a woman who's breaking new ground in Pakistan. And when it comes to DRS, should it be all or nothing in the T20 leagues? But we are over halfway through the 50 over Men's World Cup. And it's fair to say it's been a record breaking tournament as the weeks have gone on with more than a bit of drama. Unfortunately for England supporters, uh, we have to talk about another calamitous England defeat this time a heavy loss to India that left their title defence well and truly over for the holders. Um, Afghanistan continued to shine, but it was in Dharamshala where Australia and New Zealand played out an absolute thriller, um, surely one of the greatest World Cup matches of all time. It was the highest scoring World Cup game ever, a combined runs tally of 771. So, Jim, that match, first of all, I mean, New Zealand's target was a whopping 389. I mean, incredible, wasn't it, that they nearly made it, they, that they got so close even? It was. It was a brilliant run chase. And um, young Ramindra played uh, out of his socks. He was extraordinary. To keep that momentum going without giving up more wickets uh, was thrilling to watch. And uh, it's interesting to, to think about that game after the opening partnership between Warner and Head, which was going at eight, nine, ten runs and over at one stage. And to think that Australia didn't get over 400, I saw that the Ricky Ponting was very critical in the way that, you know, former captains can be about what they see. He said, it was deplorable. But they didn't get more <laughs> runs. And he had it's a been crack greedy. <laughs> and a few others in the middle order, Steve Smith, uh, for not being able to capitalise on this extraordinary momentum from the opening partnership at uh, uh, 389. It was always going to be too much, but as it turned out, it was only by five runs. And luckily for Australia, uh, Marnus Labuschagne pulled off a few wonderful stops in the final over. And I think that Mitchell Stark, who didn't take a wicket for the first time in a World Cup match, uh, was entrusted with that over. Showed you what Cummins thought about his ability to control the game. And yet when he bowled five wides, I thought, hmm, they only need eight now. Don't let another <laughs> one go down the leg side. That'll be the end of the game. So it, 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 was, it was thrilling, absolutely thrilling. And I don't think there's any doubt, the more we see Darren Charlotte with the background of the, the Himalayas, looking at one of the uh, the most attractive postcard cricket grounds in the world. So wonderful game in a, a, a lovely setting uh, with um, an excellent surface and a very, very fast outfield. Um, so well done, both teams. Uh, that um, th th that made, made number one on the hit parade so far. It was outstanding. Yeah, New Zealand's cricketers had met the Dalai Lama as well up in Dharamshala. But, I mean, that result, the way the match played out against Australia, has sort of then made New Zealand's defeat to South Africa the more surprising because it was a heavy loss to South Africa. And you mentioned Ratchin Ravindra, Jim. He didn't manage to do anything with the bat in the South Africa match. But just to talk about him a little bit, Sunil, because he's he's had a lot of attention, largely because of that, that innings against Australia. But in six matches, he scored over 400 runs. That was before the... Um, the South Africa game, but his name was being chanted around the stadium after that um, 116 under pressure against the Aussies. And we met him here on Stump, didn't we, when he was very new to the New Zealand squad. You can probably find that online for all of you listening if you search for BBC Stump. Uh, he told us about his Indian heritage. So how much is he being talked about? Oh, he's being talked about uh, a lot. I mean, you know, of course, the background to his name, Rachin. It's, uh, it's portmanteau word of uh, Rahul and Sachin. Right then, what people seem, tend to forget is Ravindra, which is Jadeja. If that's the way that I see it, he was a left-arm spinner, and he's a left-arm spinner too, you know. But yes, I mean, um, you, you must also remember about a year ago he'd come in as a tail ender, uh, number eight or number nine in the New Zealand Test team, and purely or you know predominantly as a spinner, and actually helped to save that game in Kanpur. So he, he could bat. Nobody actually thought he could bat, and certainly nobody could think that he could have batted like this. He batted out of his skin. He was wonderful, absolutely. But you know, just coming back to the game, and and Rachin Ravindra, 
obviously, if you remember, there used to be a chant that used to go up, especially in Mumbai, Sachin, Sachin, you know, it was, there was a certain lilt to it, yeah. Sachin, Sachin, you know, that's how it goes. So, Rachin, Rachin, you know, that's how it went. Uh, yeah, but just coming back to that game for a second, you know, and what Jim said is absolutely right. It was thrilling. I watched it all the way. But it just shows the importance of the no balls. If you remember that first over from Matt Henry, when he bought those two no balls and they both went for six, I mean, those are the fine margins, even in a big game like this. So I think that is what somebody needs to keep an eye on. And coming back to yesterday, you know, if you've chased an almost one, you know, 389, I, I think the stuffing is knocked out of you. you know, to chase another 300 plus score, it's just big so ask. tiring to her. Yeah, absolutely. So, but yes, I mean, he was absolutely wonderful. And as I said, to me, certainly completely unexpected. Well, the latest wave of criticism around England is centering on the, the management of the squad and not least the fact that the ECB central contracts were announced right in the middle of the tournament. And that has now led to David Willey announcing that he's retiring from international cricket um, and announcing that in the middle of the tournament now as well, because he's, you know, you read between the lines and it's, well, it's, there is an, a, a discontentment that he was the only player of this World Cup squad not offered a contract. And Rob Key, a managing director of England cricket, has said himself that David Willey was understandably pretty upset that he wasn't offered a contract. So he's now announced that he's retiring from all international cricket. Um, these things just shouldn't be happening in the middle of a tournament. You know, you've got players coming out saying, no, the contracts weren't a distraction. How can they not be? If you're negotiating and working out any contracts, your future uh, decisions like that, then, you know, yes, I'm sure some conversations would have happened before the World Cup itself. But, you know, things are still going on and it, it, it cannot be anything but um, a, a bit of a rumble and a, throughout the, the camp to have people feeling discontent in that way. Talking of rumblings, Jim, it's not all plain sailing in the Aussie camp at the moment, is it? For very different reasons, because... Uh, well, Mitchell Marsh has uh, left the camp, hasn't he, for the moment, but also without Glenn Maxwell. He's only just recovered from one freak injury, hasn't he? The the broken leg when he slipped over at a friend's place, joking around somewhat. This time, golfing related. Tell us about this one. <laughs> well, never ride, never ride on the back of a golf cart. That, that's the first lesson. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it's I a concussion, isn't it? Mm. Uh, yeah, I think he, from the sound of it, he's been back at training as we talk today, so uh, I don't think it's it's going to be a big absence. It's more precautionary because of the old concussion issue. Uh, Marsh, I'm not sh sure about, but he sounds, from what you're hearing, that uh, it's just a, a temporary um, a home going and he'll be back. But they're, they're lucky that they've got players like Steinus and, and Green uh, to back up. Um, they've got that depth. I mean, Travis Head making the most spectacular return to a side than anyone for the 59 ball 100. They're in pretty good shape. They, they'd like to get a bit more out of Steve Smith. He seems to be a bit peeved that he's been pushed down the order and um, he doesn't quite look the player he's been, but that can turn around. So Australia's in, in pretty good shape. I mean, they've got the, the leading, certainly wrist spin bowler, if not spin bowler in, in the tournament. Uh, their pace attacks doing most of what it needs to do and uh, uh, for 95% uh, of the time, their fielding's looking very adequate, sharp on the floor, solid catching. So um, I'd be very surprised if they, they didn't win enough of their remaining games to be sure of a semi-final position, despite uh, this little setback with Maxwell and Marsh. You hear the word trailblazer when talking about someone being the first to accomplish something and leading the way. And so it is the perfect word to, to describe a former Ireland international turned bowling coach, Catherine Dalton, who is our special guest this week. The 31 year old has been appointed as the first female coach in the Pakistan Super League and will be the first female fast bowling coach of any professional men's team. She'll be working with the Multan Sultans when the PSL begins on the 8th of February and she's with us now. Catherine, congratulations on this appointment. Uh, it's been uh, a few weeks since the uh, appointment. How, I mean, how long have you known about it yourself and how did it come about? Well, firstly, thank you for having me. I, I found out in August, I was actually on holiday with a few friends in Greece and uh, I was having a lovely time. And then I get a message from Ali Tareen, the owner of the franchise, and he says, you need to ring me now. 
And uh, when I hear those words or, or read those words on a text message, I think, right, I need to ring him. This could be quite a big deal. So, yeah, I found out in August I had to keep it very quiet. I wasn't allowed to tell anyone. I told a few close friends and family, but I had to keep it really quiet. So it's it's been nice over the last couple of weeks for it to be finally announced. Yeah, and, and I really noticed that Ali Tareen in, in particular really sort of cheerleading and promoting your, your appointment to make it known that you are the first to do this and, and blazing that trail. And I love the fact that the Multan Sultans have, have really shouted about your appointment. I mean, I, I remember when I first started commentating in the early sort of mid, mid-2000s and it felt as if the way to succeed was just to sort of quietly, you know, get on with it without any fanfare. But the climate just feels, you know, different enough now with women established across the game in so many areas, but still not when it comes to coaching in a men's side. So were you apprehensive in any way about how the news might be received? How did you feel about it? Well, firstly, very excited. I think that's your first instinct is to be very excited. And then you think, how is it going to be received? Am I going to be okay? And how are people going to take it? And actually, I've had such an overwhelming amount of support. It's been Mm. fantastic. And the other thing is, for me, I think, is seeing that it's not just me involved in the franchise. Ali has actually decided to empower more women and show that they're, they're, they can do these roles and positions at franchise level and hopefully one day in the international level. So obviously Alex Hartley being the assistant spin bowling coach, Hijab being the first general manager of a franchise ever um, is fantastic. So it's not just me. And uh, yeah, it's, Ali's a great advocate for promoting females in, in, within sport. So everyone talks about the IPL, of course, and the Big Bash as the premier competitions, I suppose. So do you think that the Pakistan Super League, the PSL, is up there with those leagues? Yeah, I certainly do. And I think you see the passion for cricket in the country, especially especially the passion for pace in Pakistan. I think historically that has been massive. Um, So I'm hoping, you know, while going into this competition, Multan have done well over the last couple of years. They've got to two two finals hopefully we can actually win the trophy this year who knows but yeah you're right I think the PSL is a massive competition from a fast bowling perspective there's a lot of uh, players at franchise level who are bowling 90 miles an hour I think I saw an article the other day where are the 100 mile an hour bowlers anymore that they seem to have disappeared over the last 10-15 years since Brett Lee and Shoaib Akhtar and all these guys so there's a passion for pace in Pakistan and um, a lot of the guys are bowling fairly sharp. So, yeah, it should be an exciting competition. Uh, hi, Catherine. This is hi. Sunil here for Akash Fani in India. And you've been a coach for women's teams, but how different will this be? And, you know, what's the difference that you see or feel and, or that you'll have to negotiate between women and male fast bowlers? And, and, and a codicil to that one, which is that, did you ever feel one small tremor of trepidation before you said, I'm going to take this on? I didn't. I don't know. That's just naivety. <laughs> but I just I just said yes straight away. Um, I've been very fortunate in my coaching career. I've assisted uh, Ian Pomp for a long time, who's obviously quite a well-known uh, fast bowling coach in in this mm. realm. And I've assisted him a lot on a lot of camps, actually. I've, I've been out to India for about 10 years now coaching. And I'm only 31, so I've been coaching quite a long time because I was never professional as, as a cricketer. So I had to find something else. So coaching was really my calling, my passion. I've worked out in India. I've worked with Deepak Chahar, Rajasthan Cricket Association. Did some camps over there. So I've worked with a lot of male players, Abhimanyu Mitten, a lot of first-class players here in this country as well. So um, I've never experienced it. What I found was if you can add value to a player, they don't mind where it's coming from. And the second thing I also found was the guys tend to open up to female coaches a little bit more than male coaches, which is really interesting. So they might say, I'm feeling a little bit nervous today, Kath, but they might not want to show that area of weakness to a male coach. So Mm. yeah, it's been an amazing experience. Hopefully I can, you know, empower these guys to feel confident and maybe increase their speed a little bit as well. Is this the real next step, having more female coaches in the game and not just here, but across the board and in other disciplines as well, not just bowling, but, you know, in terms of, uh, of batting and fielding and so on and so forth. Yeah, I think so. I mean, we've seen Sarah Taylor. She was really the first one to break in to the men's professional game with um, wicket-keeping coaching at Sussex. And I know she was involved in the 100 as an assistant coach as well. So it just shows you can go across the board. Um, you can work in male and female sport. You know, we see a lot of male coaches in women's cricket. So why not the other way around, I would say. 
Um, and there's a huge amount of knowledge in the women's game now. Certainly now it's professional. Um, now they're exposed to a lot more of these franchise competitions. I think we'll see a lot more females within coaching over the next 10 years or so as they push out of their own career into coaching. Congratulations, Catherine, on the appointment. Uh, good luck once you get out there to Pakistan. Enjoy it all. And thanks for being with us on Stumped. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's Catherine Dalton, who will be the first female fast bowling coach to work with a men's professional team. It's been a few weeks of, well, let's just say strange decisions in the Women's Big Bash League. There's been growing discontent amongst players and coaches surrounding the lack of both DRS and even third umpires in streamed matches that aren't on television. Now, the Melbourne Renegades duo Georgia Wareham and Hayley Matthews have been particularly vocal about the lack of technology. Um, because, Jim, there's been several instances of incorrect stumpings and run-out decisions. Um, just how bad has it been? Bean. You've got to have some uniformity in the process. I've, I've written something in the um, ABC Cricket magazine, which will be out in the next two weeks, about um, in terms of officiating, the most important person in the game of cricket now is the third umpire. He's God. He's God. <laughs> or she. Or she. Sorry, yes. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't matter who the hell's out there on the field, whether they're from either of the teams who are playing or somewhere else. I mean, they've got to get that sorted out. Get the best umpires for the best games. But the person who is in charge is the DRS because inevitably, I mean, the umpires don't even look for front foot no balls and, and they've almost got out of the habit of uh, being too concerned about a lot of the decisions that strikes me. There's a bit of guessology with some of the less uh, <coughs> experienced qualified umpires when it comes to the decision with the eye, and normally that's resolved by going upstairs. So uh, I think it's mandatory to have a third umpire and mandatory really, in particularly in televised games. I know there's a cost attached to it, but if you're going to have something like the WBBL, you, you need to have the, the best possible quality of uh, officiating. So, yes, I think it's, it's pretty obvious that, that that is what needs to occur. Yeah, Cricket Australia have said that it intends to introduce technology across all of the WBBL matches next season, or hopes to at least. Um, I remember when the Women's Ashes was played in England and, it, of course, televised, but it didn't have DRS. And it took a couple of howlers on television for that investment to then be made. And I think I'm, I'm right in saying it is, it's the host broadcaster, the host country that has to foot that cost. Um, but the game has such a profile now in, in the women's. And of course, the, the WPL in India shows that there is money in the women's game. Decisions matter for players, for their careers, and, and of course, the credibility of the league itself. Um, Sonil, there was DRS, wasn't there, in the, the WPL. Um, but do you think, though, that when, like as Jim is saying, you know, you want that technology uniformly across the professional leagues but does that actually mean that do you think the standard of umpiring away from technology actually drops a little bit because the standing umpires are not needing to kind of concentrate and watch to the same degree as they have done in the past and therefore perhaps where they then step back into a match that doesn't have technology they're not quite as good well i am so glad this question has come up i really am because, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, you could have scarecrows there with AI, you know, who could say, well, you know, go to the... Well, let's hope not. <laughs> no, I'd hope it never reaches that stage. But, you know, you go back mm. to the really great umpires. You look at Dickie Bird, you look at, you know, David Shepard. All of them, they made terrific decisions. Now, how many of them could you turn around and say were wrong? Even the, the close runouts, I mean, I'm sure Jim will remember or at least the old one, that tie test that took place uh, between uh, the West Indies and Australia. That was a line call, but it was given, it was right. That was the tight test, Joe Solomon, with that throw. So I'm saying, I think they've got lazy. I mean, sorry to use that word, but I think they've got lazy because they know now even the uh, no ball is going to be signaled from there, right? They can, you know, even if the guy is halfway past the stumps, you know, in the, in the run-out decision, they will go upstairs. I think that's taken away from the game. Eventually, it is a human game. Well, that's all we've got time for on this week's Stumped. So my thanks to Jim Maxwell and Sunil Gupta and to all of you for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.